hey, I just tried to go live twice and it said something really strange, like preconditioning failed. So, ah, yikes, let's hope that this one works. Um, it's great to see some of you watching already and just wanna say hello and welcome to the Wild Ginger Running Q&A. So this is the show where I answer all your questions about trail and ultra running live on YouTube. Um, so the questions that we're gonna be covering tonight, we are gonna be talking about the COVID-19 K challenge medals. We're gonna be discussing whether the UTM B will be going ahead or not. I've got some training advice for trail races for road runners. Um, we've got chafing and blisters covered. Um, we've got, we're going to be talking about plantar fasciitis, nutrition, like when to eat on long runs and how to deal with stomach problems like from high sugar bars and gels. And we've also got some advice um, for runners in their 50s and um, we're going to be talking about plantar fasciitis as well. So I will try and get through as many of your questions on the live chat as well, if we have time. Um, and to end the broadcast, there is two very important things. Number one thing, I need your opinion on something to do with the new podcast version of these Wednesday night shows. And number two thing, I wanna tell you about some extra content that I have made exclusive to patrons, which will air on Friday and give you something really super to watch over the weekend. So it's great to have so many of you listening and watching right now. Let's just read out a few people here. So we've got Chrissy TV, she's here. Seb's here, Phil's here. Um, Guy is here, Alex is here. Brad is here all the way from Western Canada. Hello, Brad. Um, Chloe is here as well. Catherine Dolliver is here. We've got Richard Howard. We've got John as well. So hello to everybody watching tonight live. Um, so just a little bit of an explanation if you've not seen one of these live broadcasts before. I always give priority um, with these questions to my patrons um, who are the very generous and loyal supporters of Wild Ginger Running YouTube channel. So if you want access to our inner circle, Facebook group exclusive y'all and competitions and merchandise and extra content and meetups and training advice then take a look at all the perks on patreon.com slash wildgingerrunning and it is there. There it is, patron, support me on it if you would like access to all those perks. Um, so gonna start answering those questions in just a moment, but firstly, I just wanna say a big, big, massive, like really ginormous thank you to all of my patrons for being so loyal. It's just absolutely incredible of you. You're all just fantastic people. You are keeping me going right now, so I'm just so grateful to all of you. Um, and we have some newcomers joining us this month, um, so just going to read out a few names to say welcome before I get back to the live chat and do a few more hellos because I know we've got some more people joining us. So I want to say welcome to Elizabeth Ernst, to Angela Rodriguez, Anders Josephson, Hannah Baisley, or I think it might be Hannah Neal, um, uh, Vic Knight, Emma Morton, Andrew Devine, Stephen Taylor, and Jem Visser. So thank you all so much for joining me on Patreon. That's really kind of you. And I just wanna say a super duper massive extra thank you to um, all the loyal patrons who have upped their pledges to support me during the coronavirus outbreak because because of losing my writing and my event work. So I can't thank you enough, guys. So massive big shout out to Alex DeHoto, Jamin Longhurst, Peter Henley, Brad Rush, who I know is watching tonight, uh, Philip Haddock, who I think is also watching tonight, um, Nadia Federman, Stuart Obrey, and Becky Nisbet as well. I hope I've got everyone in there. Um, that's the most recent ones anyway. So thank you so much, guys. And if I haven't read your name out and that you, you think that you should deserve a special extra shout out, then just message me on Patreon and I will do that. So just going to say a quick hello to all the people joining us now and we'll crack on with the first question, which is from Arlene Maitlock and it's about the COVID-19 K challenge. So let's just scroll back through the live chat and just say a couple more hellos. So we've got John Airy. 
Um, he's joined us here. Um, Amanda Armstrong is here as well. Sonia's here as well. Darren is here. So hi, Darren. Darren won the competition, the patron-only competition, um, last month. Uh, so he is very happy at the moment. I've just read your message on Patreon, Darren, so I'll be replying to you shortly. <laughs> we've got David McGilvery, um, and we've got Hannah Bais Baisley here as well. Um, I just read out her name earlier. And then we've got Dave Archer as well, and Antonio. Cardinelli, hello to you. It's absolutely fantastic to have so many of you watching, especially as it's so nice outside. Isn't it a gorgeous, gorgeous day? Um, I'd be outside if I was you. Maybe you can walk around your garden um, watching this. Oh, we've just got Catherine saying hello as well. Fantastic. Okay, so the first question that we're going to address today, I'm going to try and get, there's loads of questions, going to try and get through them all. So Arlene Matelock says, is there going to be a COVID-19 challenge medal for us to buy? Um, so, short answer, yes. Um, so the COVID-19 K challenge, um, for anyone who doesn't know, is a challenge that I set up when the COVID lockdown first um, came out. And it's the challenge to walk, or run, walk or cycle at least 19 K every week, um, according to your own government's guidelines. So people are doing this across the world. It's absolutely fantastic. We've got 2000 people in the Facebook group right now, all motivating each other, giving each other support um, and just uh, kind of keeping each other going um, at such a difficult time. And and then amazingly, we've got 80,000 people in the Strava group, which is just absolutely crazy. Um, so that's been brilliant as well. Slightly nerve wracking, just in case anybody does anything silly, but everyone's been super good in there so far. And so at the end, I thought we should mark um, just mark it with a medal, shouldn't we? So I've been investigating medals and I'm gonna show you some pictures that Steve, um, my husband, he's um, an illustrator, he's mocked these up for us. So the first one is the metal medal just here. So that is the metal medal that will be available to buy. Um, and then there's a wooden version as well, because I just thought, oh, it'd be good to be eco-friendly as well, wouldn't it? So there's the option, if you want to be eco-friendly, to have a wooden medal. Hello! <laughs> there as well. So that is a picture of the wooden medal. And these are going to be available, um, hopefully, fingers crossed, in a couple of weeks' time. Because what I'm doing is I'm having my website redesigned so that there's going to be a shop bit on there. So these will be able to... Um, you'll be able to buy these in the shop on my website and all of the profits are going to go to a COVID related charity and we're going to vote for that charity in the Facebook group um, via a poll. So if you're not in the COVID 19k Facebook group already then jump in there and then when we're ready to start selling these we will do a poll and we will put the proceeds towards whichever charity wins and it could be that a couple of charities benefit. It just I just have no idea how many people are going to want one of these medals I mean I'm hoping like maybe 2,000 people will want a medal um, but you just never know do you I mean with 80,000 people sorry I'm just trying to get this a bit smaller <laughs> with 80,000 people in the face uh, with in the Strava group you'd think that maybe quite a few people might want one but you just you just don't know um, so yeah I am working on that at the moment and as soon as my website is ready the new website with the shop in it I'll be putting these up and everybody can start to pre-order because what I'll have to do is order them in bulk and then I, I think I will be basically in here putting them all in envelopes, addressing them, and then taking them to the post office. I think that's how I'm gonna do it. Um, unless there's like 80,000 people, in which case I might have to have a distribution company helping, but we'll just cross that bridge when we come to it, hey. So though that answers your question there, Arlene. Um, so yes, there will be a COVID 19K challenge medal to buy all profits to charity. So thank you very much for your question. And talking of COVID-19 care, uh, just talking of COVID in general, um, Chloe has the next question. Um, she wants to know about my thoughts for the UTMB this year. Um, she wants to know if they're gonna cancel it or not because she's got a place on the CCC and she wants to know whether it's still worth training. Or, or she says, shall I just eat cake instead? And um, 
I would say to that, Chloe, I would always eat the cake. I would always eat the cake and I would also do the training. So I did a little bit of research on this for you, Chloe, because I know that a few people that I'm friends with on Facebook, kind of other journalists and things have been looking into this. Um, and for example, Ian Corliss, who does the Talk Ultra podcast, really excellent podcast, get on it if you can. Um, he put a post up on Facebook saying that the French government have outlawed, well, they've sort of banned, at the moment, they've banned events of over 5,000 people until September. And as you know, the UTMB is just before the start of September. It's like the last weekend of August, and sometimes it kind of goes on to the, the first day of September. Um, so they haven't cancelled it yet, the UTMB organisers. And I've read in this article here um, from a Canadian trail running website, um, it basically says that um, the organisers of the UTMB are going to be doing as much as they can to make the event go ahead. So potentially they might not be able to accommodate t the 10,000 entrants they usually have, but they could potentially cap the race at 5,000, then it might be possible. So the race organisers say that they're working on barrier measures um, for the start and for everywhere throughout the race, um, and they don't want to give up. They still want to organise the event, um, but in compliance with the rules, um, because basically they're saying that the entire economic community of the Mont Blanc, Mont Blanc Valley needs the event to happen um, so yes they are trying to get that event to go ahead um, so I would say if anybody is um, oh, just get rid of that if anybody is um, has got a place on UTMB or any of the UTMB races like the CCC etc I would say just continue your training as normal until you hear a definitive answer because at the moment the race organizers want the race to go ahead personally I think it's a tall order but we can just keep our fingers crossed and just keep training anyway. It's, it's all good practice. It's all good practice, isn't it? Just keep, keep, keep the training, I'd say, and keep eating the cake, Chloe, as well. That is what I would say. And uh, yeah, people on the live chat um, are also agreeing with me. Catherine Tolliver says that cake is life. And Chloe Mason says, I love cake, but love running more. Oh, that is a good question. What do you love more, running or cake, running or cake? If you could only have one thing in your life, running or cake what would it be i think i would have to go for running actually as well yeah i would be very sad to lose the cake though wouldn't you um guy gray trek says train then you can eat the cake well exactly that's why we all run isn't it um yep um alan murphy says they are making a decision on may the 20th the utmb committee have not been very helpful to us so far who have spent a lot of money already I know it is a lot of money, isn't it? And it's a, it is a big race, but I think what they are trying to go ahead with it, that's what they want. They want the race to go ahead. So I think they're, they're trying not to cancel. So they're waiting to see what might happen because you know, it could clear up sooner than we think, or we could be all still sat here in October. You just don't know, do you? So I think it's worth training um, and just go for it. And if it is canceled, then um, at least you will have got a good base of training in there. Um, yeah, and um, Chrissy TV says you can always do Ambleside 60k in September if it goes ahead if others are cancelled. Um, yeah, it is it's a tough one, isn't it, guys? It is a real tough one, but I'm sure the organisers are doing everything that they can to make that race go ahead as well. And John Airy says, our club runs for cake and beer. <laughs> and Chloe says, running and biscuits. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Seb says, I hope they'd move the points over at least to next year. I would have thought they would. I mean, if you're going to cancel the race for this year, surely you've just got to run it with the same people the following year. Otherwise, that's just not fair. Um, but yeah, I would say keep training, keep eating the cake and uh, keep that motivation up because it may go ahead. If I had to say either way, I'd say it probably won't. But that's being really pessimistic. Maybe it will. I want it to go ahead as well because I want to go there. I'm running, I'm supposed to be running the UTMB route um, over six days just before the UTMB. Um, so it could be that I'm still able to do that. But then if the UTMB event isn't going ahead, I'll just come home. Um, but yeah, I, I want it to go ahead as well. Um, so let's all keep our fingers crossed. Right, moving on to the next question, which is a very interesting question from Paul Hamilton, 
and he says, as a newbie to trail running, what one bit of trail running advice would you give to me? Um, he's trained for a lot of road races, but never for a trail or an ultra race. So I know he said one, but I've got three really important bits of advice for you here, Paul. So number one is, I think the number one thing coming from road to trail running is the terrain. So the terrain is, is obviously different, right? So you've got to be looking down at your feet because there's rocks, there's rubble, there's mud, there's all sorts going on there. So looking ahead, not just down at your feet, so kind of scanning the trail ahead, take light footsteps as well. So you might need some kind of shorter strides. It's not as rhythmical as running on the road. Um, so be prepared for a break in the stride. Um, and sometimes you want to just get your arms out for balance so um, especially if you're going down some steep bits or tricky rocky sections um, arms out for balance as well so I would practice training on local trails um, and if you can like obviously not at the moment because we are restricted with what we can do but usually you'd want to be driving somewhere maybe at the weekends if you can um, and just going on the trails there just to get a feel for how different it is to running on roads but at the moment, because we can't do that, um, I would suggest that you run um, locally in parks, um, deliberately on the rough stuff. So, you know, like if there's a grass verge next to the pavement or um, through the local woods, um, there's always a bit of rough stuff, isn't there? Like there's a normal track and then there's like a bit of grass. So run on that rather than the easy pavement. And I would say, slow down at first and then practice speeding up. So if you've got like say, uh, just even a 10 meter stretch of rough ground that you can practice on in your local area, then then go over it a few times, a bit like hill reps. Just jog over it to start with and then go a bit faster, go a bit faster still, um, but you don't have to go fast at all in trail running and that is the point that I wanna come on to now, which is point number two, which is forget your PBs. So looking at pace and splits isn't the same as road running because the terrain is really hilly and it's really uneven. There's various different weather conditions. You've probably got the wind in your face, etc. So try not to put too much pressure on yourself to be as fast as your road time for the same distance. So say you've done a 10K road race in like 45 minutes or something like that, then you wouldn't be looking at the same kind of time for a trail race. So don't take that, don't put that pressure on yourself. Um, give yourself much more like an hour or maybe depending on the hills, maybe even an hour 15, maybe even an hour and a half, you don't know. Um, and it depends on your fitness level. Um, and the weather conditions and the subsequent conditions underfoot also make each race different. So it's hard even to compare your course time with the same course the following year with trail running. So yeah, number two is forget the PBs. Then number three is um, walk up the hills. So sometimes it can be more efficient to walk rather than run up the hills. Um, and you know when this point is, is when you can walk faster than other people are jogging up beside you. So take a look around and see if people are really going like balls out to try and keep running up the hill and see if you can walk at the same pace as them. It's not a stroll, it's like a power walk they call it. I think they call it power hiking to make it sound cool. Uh, but basically it's just walking really quickly and sometimes you can put your hands on your knees to sort of um, make yourself go faster and just really push down. Um, and basically if you are running up a hill and your breathing starts to become really out of control um, and you're just breathing super hard, your heart's bump, pumping super hard, that is the point when you want to start moving into your power hike and all the elite athletes do this at the UTMB in 2019 I was uh, on a on a stretch which was kind of flat and then it went into this hill section just like I don't know like 20% hill it was quite steep none of the elite athletes ran it none not even the race leader they all got their poles out because it was a long race and they just started power hiking up this hill it was it was super fast it was faster than I could walk I had a job keeping up with them but they did not run up that hill so that is tip number three walk up the hills and and there's a bonus tip actually uh, as well as that enjoy it Otherwise, what is the point? Enjoy it, look at the scenery, um, chat to like-minded people, and just generally have a whale of a time, Paul, because it's just a fantastic sport that you've got yourself into, and um, I hope it all goes really well for you. 
Okay, so we'll just check the live chat to see if anyone has any more um, information that could be useful to us here. Um, I think everybody is talking still about the UTMB, so that is good. Um, uh, oh, Guy has one tip, actually. He said he would get some hill training in, so that's a really good thing. Yeah, I would also recommend that so maybe one session per week do some hill intervals just to get yourself used to running up the hills but then also if the hill is super steep then obviously the walking up the hills is also good that's great so that's good ah oh, and Paul is actually here that's great hi Paul I'm glad you like that advice so Paul's just written in to say brilliant advice thank you so that's good and Ruth is here as well she says hello everybody lovely weather in the UK forest running has never felt better um hi to, hi to you Ruth I'm glad you're having a lovely day and John says that he agrees as well pick a nice easy trail to start with that is a good point even if you're super super fit pick an easy one to start with because then you can ace it and you'll feel really good about yourself so so yeah go easy and enjoy yourself Paul oh and John Gardner is here from the United States hi to you John it's great to have you all watching fantastic I can't believe you're all watching the telly rather than outside it's a beautiful day out there maybe you're watching in your garden okay so the next question is from John Airy let me just get this up on screen so John says chafing what do I use to avoid chafing? He has used Body Glide in the past um, and um, he had uh, chafing on his thighs um, at the Great Eastern Run and that took a week to stop hurting. He had to actually use Burns dressings. Wow, that sounds really, really painful, John. And I, I don't get chafing very often because I know that my thighs rub together at the top. So therefore I always wear like um, legging type um, shorts I can't I, I just can't wear normal shorts um, because they'll just ride up and then my thighs will chafe together it's just a fact even when I was really super thin like nine stone my thighs still rubbed together so I know that it's not just a, a thing about you know I don't need to lose weight or anything to stop them chafing um, but yes, uh, I just have to wear three quarter length leggings. So there is stuff about your clothing that you can do. So some some shorts you can get. They're called um, there's a there's a Run Hill Twin Skin short, and it has like cycling shorts, and then they've got like a bagginess around them. So it's sort of two shorts in one, so that you're not just wearing cycling shorts. Um, so I know that uh, they do those type of shorts. So that could be worth it. Um, and then chafing cream wise, um, I don't have a ton of experience with anti-chafe creams, but Marcus Scottney, um, who we chatted to on last Wednesday's live chat, he's the record holder of the Cape Breath Ultra, he recommended Gurney Goo, and he also recommended Squirrels Nut Butter. So I've put links to those in the show notes just, just below. Um, there's a If you click on the link to look at the film description, there'll be show notes in there. Um, and Marcus's interview is in there, and also some links to Gurney Goo and Squirrels Nut Butter which he recommends. Um, I did get really bad chafing once, and this is a really horrible story. <laughs> I don't know whether I should tell it you or not, um, but I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you. So on my Bob Graham round in 2013, I had a really bad chafing on the final leg of the route, which is leg five, which goes from Dale Head um, and over to Robinson, which is the final summit of, um, of the 42 mountains in this 65 mile fell running challenge. And, and I got really bad chafing and it was, it was actually in like between my bum cheeks. Sorry, everyone. Um, <laughs> really, really horrible, really, really painful. And it was because it was so rainy and wet and basically my leggings, it, like, everything was just wet. I was just really wet and I'd been going for 24 hours by then. I did the Bob Graham in 26 and a half hours. Um, so I'm not in the club, but I did it, so I don't care. And so so basically I got this really bad chafing like, in, like within my bum cheeks. I didn't have any lube, all I had was a lip seal, you know, like the the um, the uh, Vaseline type stuff that you put on your lips if you get chapped lips, and so 
So basically, I had to stop and I had to gouge out some of the lip seal and then put it on the chafing bit. But the really embarrassing thing was, I sent everybody who was supporting me ahead saying, I've got this really bad chafing and it's in a, a very a private area and I need you all to go ahead. So I'll just like, I'll do it here and then you're all ahead of me. And I didn't realise that this guy called Tim had, he'd not heard that because he'd stayed back to take some photos of the mountains and halfway through applying this like random lip Lipsil to my bum, he ran across from behind me and saw everything, and it was a really, really embarrassing. So, um, so don't do that, everybody. Um, apply your anti chafe cream before you need it and in a private place if you can. <laughs> There's actually quite a funny thing in um, in Paul Tonkinson's marathon running book about chafing as well. Um, he saw um, he saw uh, James Cracknell applying it at like an it was just, it's really funny, you've got to read the book. <laughs> or watch his interview, um, which was a couple of weeks back on my channel as well. So I hope that helps you, John, um, about the chafing. Oh, he says he has worn cycling shorts or tights under shorts before. Oh, well that is really annoying then, John. Um, yeah. Um, and then John just says to, to add in, this is quite helpful, he says it's worth experimenting with a few different clothing brands because some makes are way better than others in terms of the stitching. Um, yeah, and John Airy says bum cheek chafing is really bad because you lose the fine hair that keeps the cheeks from sticking together. <laughs> Great, John, I don't, I'm not sure I have much of that, but yes, for the blokes, yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I think that... Um, I think applying before you need it is good and um, as Marcus said in the broadcast that we did last week, you get what you pay for with these anti-chafing creams so you might have to invest, John, in um, a step up from Body Glide so maybe some squirrels nut butter um, might be good for you. So let us know how it goes, John, and hope you don't get chafing on your next long run or your next race whenever we are allowed to do them. So the next question is similar. We have got a question from Kat Roberts and she wants to know about blisters. So, um, Kat Roberts says, after your Cape Wrath experience, what did you change blister wise? Um, Cause she's moved to Injinji Toe Socks after she got blisters on Race to the King. And she fancies two to three day running jolly with her friends um, when we're all let out. And she doesn't want blisters to ruin it. This is a really good question, Kat. Um, because um, Kat has, is referring to the film that I put out on Monday, which if you haven't seen it, um, give it a look. It's me probably at my worst <laughs> in the mountains. Um, I was doing the Cape Wrath Ultra, which is 250 miles, eight days across Scotland. I thought it'd be a fantastic way to see Scotland and have an adventure, but actually the event was way too hard for me. And also I got really excruciating blisters. Um, so Kat wants to know if I've changed anything. Basically, the thing I have changed is that I just haven't done such a hard race. <laughs> so I basically, after that, I just thought it's too much. It's too much training in my life and the way that I want to lead my life. And it's too, it's too, yeah, it was just too far. Like, there was a few 40, 35, 40 mile days um, with about like 3,000 meters of ascent, super, super hard, like stuff that you'd be like, you'd do it one Sunday and you'd think, oh, wow, that was a good, that was a good race, you know, and then you'd have a rest for a few days, but this was eight days of it. Um, so after that, I did six days around the Isle of Man, and that was more like 15 to 20 miles every day, and the ascent was a lot less as well, so I was out for more like, I don't know, like five, five hours and stuff, taking photos, doing films and chatting to people and stuff like that. So basically, I just, just lowered the distance and lowered the ascent. So uh, I didn't get blisters at all on that run, that run at all because my feet didn't swell up either. Um, but you mentioned in Gingy Toe Socks, that they wouldn't have helped me on that particular race because what happened was my feet were squished inside the shoe. So what I really should have done was buy bigger shoes. Um, I didn't factor in the fact that my feet would swell. I knew they would swell because it was an ultra, but 
I didn't factor in that, they, that it would also be so hot at that time of year in Scotland. It was really, really hot. And so my feet were just bigger because it was hotter as well. So they didn't fit in to the shoe. And so they were being squished like this. Oh, I'll show you a picture of my blisters. Here we go, then you'll know what I mean. So they were being squashed. And so I was getting blisters between the toes, which were really, really painful. I know it doesn't look like much, but they were really excruciating. It was so horrible. So if I had worn in gingy socks, um, they, they make your toes go even bigger out like that because there's a bit of material between each thing. So then they squash your feet even more. So I think next time I will probably try some anti-chafing lube type stuff. I will try that, but I also would just um, take a pair of bigger shoes. I ended up the following week spending the whole week wearing Steve's shoes and he's a size eight. So, and I'm a size five or six. So I went up two whole shoe sizes and towards the end of the race, I had to actually, I came back in the race for day eight. I missed day five, six and seven. And I had to borrow my tent one foot, had to go in a size seven shoe because it would it just wouldn't fit in my, my normal shoe. Um, so yeah, I, I think the other thing to, to know about blisters and stuff like that is it's, you get, you just get to know your own body and your own, your own feet. Um, so you have to build up slowly to these big multi days. Um, doing a three day is really good. Um, and there's quite a lot of three days and I'm going to tell you some good events in a minute as well. Um, there's quite a lot of free, three days, um, but then it kind of jumps, like there's loads of three days and then there's like the dragon's back race, which is five days and mentally like a huge ascent, huge distance. And then there's Cape Wrath Ultra, which is eight days. So yeah, I think you've just got to do a load of those events and know what can happen and then jump on hotspots as soon as they start happening. That was the other thing that I didn't do on day one. I was getting the inklings of a blister and I stupidly, ignored it because I didn't want to get behind and I didn't want to um I was running with some people and I didn't want to be last <laughs> and yeah so I was basically just I was just stupid and did all the things that I tell people not to do um so you wanted some suggestions for events um and I'll just read out some of the lives because there might be some good blister chat there um and um, Angela Rodriguez says, oh, I came into the conversation at the right time. I think she just came in when we were talking about bum chafe. So welcome, Angela. <laughs> and um, uh, Arlene suggests little towlets of anti-chafing cream. Oh, that is interesting. Nice suggestion there, Arlene. Um, and um, <laughs> Catherine says that it makes sense. Eight days of con consecutive days of, of run, mental running was the problem, not the socks. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think the socks was the problem. It was the fact that my feet were being squashed in my shoes. I just needed bigger, wider shoes. And then somebody, John, has said, have I tried ultras? So ultras are really wide fit shoes. Yes, I've tried ultras. Um, the problem for me personally with the ultras is that they're zero drop. Um, and that gives me problems with my plantar fasciitis. I'm, I'm just a mess, guys. Don't worry about me, I'll, I'll get it sorted. I just won't run as far and I'm fine with that. Um, so yeah, I have tried Ultras and they are a really good option for a lot of people who need a wider fitting shoe. Innovates are usually quite wide enough um, and also uh, Hocker, I think, do a wide fit as well. So I would go for that as well. Um, uh, John Airy is still talking about his uh, chafing um, and Catherine said, thanks, that's very helpful. Um, <laughs> and John Aries talking about his racist and he says a marshal asked if they could help but he was reapplying anti-chafe cream so he said no I don't think you could help with this <laughs> I know yeah it needs to go in some it's pretty obscure places doesn't it um, great okay so um, Kat wanted some suggestions for short multi-dayers um, uh, recommendations for shorter slash easier multi-day events. Now this is an interesting question because like in my opinion there needs to be, maybe I should set up a race but I think there needs to be some shorter multi-dayers. Like what's wrong with just running 15 to 20 miles every day? All the multi-dayers that I see that you can sign up to is like a marathon every day. It's just like that's a bit far isn't it when you're doing that day in day out for some people anyway. So a really good starter event, and I know you've done one of these um, already, Kat, but this is for anybody else listening, um, is uh, the threshold events. So you've got race to the stones, race to the king, race to the tower, race race to the anything you like, 
um, things. They are weekenders, so you can do you can either do them as a full ultra or you can do them as kind of like a, a marathon a day, just over the weekend, two marathons. Um, then um, you've got the X Energy um, races. They do the Druids Challenge and the Devils Challenge. So Druids Challenge is in November. It's 29 miles ish a day for three days, and then the Devils Challenge is in May, and that's a similar one. So. I've actually done the Druids Challenge twice and in 2017 I filmed it so there's a playlist on my channel and if you look in the film description or the show notes below um, you'll see a link to that playlist. Um, other races, there's VO2's three day trail marathon challenges so there's the Atlantic Coast, there's the Jurassic Coast and there's the Devon Coast challenges so they're really good. My friend Janine, she did one of those um, just uh, recently I think and she said it was really hard because it's really hilly and rocky um, it's about a marathon a day uh, but it's three days so that's that's a good amount of time like you can kind of push through anything in, in three days and you don't start to get blisters like I wasn't really dying until day four <laughs> as you could see <laughs> um, Ring of Fire also is um, 135 miles in three days around Anglesey so that might be a good one to go for and then I just wanted to recommend a couple of foreign races as well because one of them I have done I think three times now and I really blooming love it. So I wanted to just suggest to you a couple. Um, one I really want to do, so the Camille de Caval uh, 360 in Mallorca, um, that looks like a really epic event. I've just got a screen grab of that here. So that looks brilliant and there's actually different types of race that you can do. So you can, you can opt for a shorter one or a longer distance one. So you can do anything from like half a marathon to a marathon every day and that's for three days so that looks really really cool I think and I would love to do that one year maybe I'll do it next year it looks really cool um, and then a race that I just kept going back to because I love it so much is the Icebug Experience in Sweden so just got a little screen grab of that I can show you so just look at that like the trails are amazing over there in Sweden um, you just go through these it's kind of coastal and you go across all these amazing pink rocks and through these sort of valleys made of rock and chasms and then forest and across lakes and and it's wonderful and then you camp when you don't camp that's the great thing you're in this little holiday vis village with all these chalets so you're in the chalet and there's a sauna right next to the sea and you can so you can get in the sauna and get really hot at the end of the run and then you can jump into the sea and get cold again and oh it's so refreshing it's, it's absolutely amazing and the, every day at the end of the day which um the distances are kind of like anything from sort of 15 to 20 kilometers even or miles or is it miles like the longest day is only about 20 miles or something like that it's, it's really really doable distances you're sort of finished in a few hours and then you get all this amazing Swedish food so they get the local providers of the food to come in and tell you about all the things that are in the buffet so they had like a sausage expert come in they had a pasta person come in and they then they had a coffee expert come in and they have talks from various ultra runners and things like that in the evening it's, it's really really nice event and the weather is usually really nice um, I have actually made a film about the top 10 multi-day races already on my channel so the link to that film is in the description below or the podcast show notes whichever you are watching this on um so uh cat says thank you she hadn't heard of the x energy challenges or the ring of fire um and she got put off the jurassic coast one as her friend said it was too tough um yes those jurassic coast ones the the um vo2 max events there i think you can sign up to just do one day or two days so you don't have to do the whole three days so that you could just do one one year and then um and then the next one you could do two of them and then the next event you could do say three and just kind of work yourself up that way um so yeah you could do that as well and the Swedish one is a really good holiday. Let's see if anybody else has got any recommendations. So Seb has a recommendation as well. He recommends the Walser Trail Challenge in the Alps. So it's 15K with 100 metres of vert on day one, 30K, 2,000 metres of vert on day two. Great scenery and really well, well organised. That sounds like a really good event. Thank you for sharing that, Seb. That's really awesome. So off we go, all of us, to do the Walser Trail. Um, uh, Guy Greatrex says you can do a half marathon Tissington Trail on the Saturday or Sunday or do both. That would be good training. That's super good as well. Fabulous. Um, 
and yeah some question about Gore-Tex shoes is happening um, ah yes I'll quickly answer this question from Super Jethro Tull about Gore-Tex shoes for fast packing um, in the Alps July had to hurt no camping so personally I would not use Gore-Tex shoes um, I don't actually own a pair right now the only time that I find them useful is for doing stuff like standing around a lot like if I were a marshal or if I was like walking and stopping a lot like doing a photo shoot for a brand or something um, so the reason that I wouldn't use them for actually running or doing any kind of strenuous movement is because you would get sweaty feet especially in July in the Alps because it's probably quite dry so you probably wouldn't need Gore-Tex shoes in the Alps in July um, so I just go for a normal pair um, and you could just put in a pair of waterproof socks if you had a drizzly day. Um, the combination of um, normal trail running shoes with a pair of waterproof socks is, is really, really good for those conditions where, you know, you're doing a lot of just hiking around with um, like puddles and wet grass and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, you could just put in a pair of waterproof socks. So that is a very quick answer to that question. Um, and we have got another suggestion from Arlene M who says in the US there is a mid-Atlantic marathon and half marathon series so it's one to five days of marathons or half marathons that sounds really good doesn't it I, I think I'm really gonna have to look into this because like my my thing is like doing these super big long races like the UTMB stuff like that I, I want to do them slower I, I want to run them but I don't want to run them and be in pain and be just like like hating it and not have time to look at the views and things because I mean why else are you doing it but to look at the amazing view so that's my plan the plan was it this year was to do the UTMB over six days not sure if that's going to go ahead um but then in the future it'd be really cool wouldn't it to do like the spine race maybe over a week um no not maybe over a week maybe two weeks or the Cape Wrath like ultra over two weeks and the spine race wouldn't that be amazing to do that over two weeks It'd be brilliant wouldn't it you have plenty of time to do everything and you could stay in a nice B&B &B as well um cool right let us move on to the next question from Sonia another of my amazing patrons she wants to know about my plantar injury so she wants to know how my plantar fasciitis is going. Um, did I manage to get rid of it? If so, how? And if not, how am I managing it at the moment? Um, so that is another good question. So uh, plantar fasciitis is um, it's sort of a pain kind of in the heel area and sort of in, in the arch area of the foot. Um, and it's, it kind of seems to come on with overuse, especially for me. So uh, basically, if I, I've got a standing desk, if I use the standing desk all day and stand up all day, I kind of feel it coming on a little bit. If I use shoes with quite a low drop, so that's a, a, a low differential from the heel to the toe so that, it, that it's not got a big heel stack on it. If I use low drop shoes like the Ultras, then I start to feel it coming on as well. The, the way that I've found that manages it super well at the moment is to wear um, really high drop shoes. So like the 10, 12 mil drop road running shoes from Brooks. So I'm currently wearing the Brooks Adrenaline a ATS, I think I think they are, or ATR, something like that. But I, because the trails are quite dry at the moment, I'm just using them for literally everything um, if I'm running a long way. If I'm running like 40 minutes to an hour, I can get away with using the Ho Hoka Speed Goat 4s, which I think are around like 4 mil drop drop um, so basically I I think I am managing my plantar fasciitis rather than it's actually gone completely away but it's so much better than it was um, but yeah it just happens when I wear shoes that just have no drop on them so I think it's because after doing a lot of training for the coastal challenge in 2015 I read born to run and uh, I think I read it again, I read it ages ago, but I read it again and I thought, oh, of course I can run barefoot. So I've got these like Vibram five fingers and I was running loads in those, running really low, low drop innovate shoes as well. And then I just got injured and it, and it was like I, it was, it felt like I like broke my foot in the arch area, I felt like I broke it and I like literally couldn't even walk for two weeks. That's how bad it was. Cause you know what runners are like, we just ignore stuff, don't we? So I just ignored it and just pushed through the pain until it actually broke 
everything. So yeah, then I couldn't run for like a year or so, which was really gutting. Had to do a lot of walking and cycling. Um, and yeah, that was annoying. Um, but yeah, it's kind of okay now. Um, but also along with that, I put a half marathon limit on myself for 2019 because I think I just got totally overworked, overtrained. I was doing ultras all over the place, training for really long stuff. Um, and yeah, so now I'm being sensible, not, not really doing many ultras at the moment, um, but uh, training myself up for the UTMB six day. Um, and then beyond that, probably get back into, you know, like 35 milers, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, uh, Plantar is um, going okay. Uh, uh, yes, I wanted to recommend you a book in case you want to know more about plantar and any other injuries. This is my go-to book on injuries. It's got tons of useful advice on plantar and other stuff, any kind of lower leg, um, up, or all the way up to the hip and lower back injuries in here. It's called Running Free of Injuries, and it's by Paul Hobra, who is a super good physio. He's, um, he's physio Paula Radcliffe, um, former world marathon record holder, and Steve Cram as well, um, holder of um, shorter distance records here in the UK and um, it's really good and he just gives you like a protocol to follow um, there's loads of um, diagrams in there about what like what's going on and you can self-diagnose and you can self-treat as well so I recommend that and there is links to this book in the description below the film so check it out it's very very good um, Okay, oh, this is interesting. Chrissy TV says, uh, me too. She changed her shoes from high drop and she got the first injury of her life. And now she's worn a knee support every day for two months. Yeah, so I think the message there is just some people can't take a lower drop shoe. Um, some people are fine. It's, it's not for every, it's, but it's just not for everyone. So you have to kind of know yourself. Um, and if you do want to change to lower drop shoes, um, just have a think about why you're doing it. Like, uh, are you fine as you are? Are you not injured? Because just don't change anything if you're not injured. <laughs> um, and if you do change, change really gradually. So just do one mile one week and then two miles the next week. Like, honestly, take it super, super gradual. Because as John Gardner says, plantar fasciitis is very difficult to shake off. Yes, uh, Philip Haddock says you can get insoles for them as well. Yes, you can, but they tend to make your running shoes a little bit stiffer uh, and heavier as well. So I have I've steered clear of those. I kind of wanted, I kind of wanted to just sort it out. Like I wanted my own body to sort it out. Um, and Guy Greatrex says great book. He's got the Running Free of Injuries book, and he said it super helped him out too. So that's good. Oh, Sonia's got the book too. Um, oh no, that's the wrong one. Uh, Sonia's got the book too and she loves it. Um, Nigel Barnett has also had PF, plantar fasciitis, so he sympathises as well. Um, uh, and John says, see a physio to cure long-term PF. It presents in the foot and heel, but it's due to weakness elsewhere. Yes, exactly. It's really good to see a, a physio. I know physios are expensive, but they, they can sort stuff out for you. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, lots of calf raises and calf stretching and lots of strength exercises. I recommend doing strength work at least once a week. Um, I started doing more strength work and I, maybe it is helping because it is better. Anyway, question, the next question, oh, I need to rattle through these otherwise it's going to be another super long one like Marcus's one was the other night, isn't it? So, um, 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 Catherine would like some suggestions on nutrition and Nadia also wants some advice on gels. So I'm going to do these two kind of together because they are kind of similar um, questions. And then we've got, oh yes, we've got one more question. And um, yay, that means I've got through more. Brilliant. Okay, so uh, Catherine wants to know about nutrition on long runs. Um, now she's got no races happening. Uh, she says she's getting into bad habits and she wants to know when she should eat. Um, during long runs and like ultras and, and things like that and Nadia is she has get she's getting problems with um, high sugar snacks like gels and bars um, so she wants recommendations um, because I'm, I'm guessing that she's having stomach problems with those high sugar foods um, so firstly I'll address Catherine, Catherine's question so um, 
So basically, if you're eating normally um, and you haven't just pre-fatigued yourself with some kind of massive effort, um, then normally you have enough glycogen stored in the muscles for about 60 to 90 minutes of exercise. So if, I, if I'm doing, say, just a two-hour run, I don't usually eat anything. I will take something, but I don't usually need to eat anything, um, especially as my two-hour runs, my long runs will be at a very steady pace, so like at a low heart rate, like, you know, like 140 beats per minute, that kind of thing, just nice and steady, getting the endurance base there. But any longer than that, and if, if you plan to do a longer run than that, I would actually start eating, say, at 60 to 90 minutes into the run. So I would eat probably about 100 to 200 calories every hour. So that's, you could break that up to every 20 minutes, like a little snack three times the three times in an hour. So that's a couple of jelly babies or maybe a gel every 20 to 30 minutes. But if you're forgetting to eat, and if you're not eating, and then you describe this kind of bonking that was happening towards the end of your run, why not put it in your drink? So why not get some energy powder and pop it in and take frequent sips to keep you fueled up? Because that might be a way of getting that fuel in um, and you don't have to remember to eat. Um, so that might be helpful for you there, Catherine. Um, Nadia, um, she has a slightly different issue with the, those stomach problems with the usual bars and gels. So I know that um, you posted this in the Patreon group, Nadia, and lots of people suggested some really good alternatives for you. Like some people were suggesting dates um, and Pascal Mathene, um, she suggested some savory foods like cheese and nuts and things like that. So that could, um, could stand you in good stead. But but basically all energy, like high energy giving items will have some form of sugar in it where like it could be fructose, it could be, um, they, they use maltodextrose, they use um, uh, glu just straight straight up glucose. Um, they The energy gels and the bars, they tend to use a mixture of those different types of sugar because they will hit your bloodstream at different times. So they try and sort of eke it out so it's not just like a great sugar spike, like a jelly baby, which is pure glucose, which I love. Um, so, um, so all energy giving foods will basically have some form of sugar in. You can't really like you can't really get low sugar energy foods if you know what I mean. If you want a low sugar energy food, then then maybe some think more like cheesy cheddars and um, you know cheese, nuts, that kind of thing, like protein and fat type stuff. Um, but if you're getting constant gut problems when you're eating these kind of higher sugar foods, it might be worth just seeing if you're hydrated enough, because. Once um, on the Druids Challenge, actually, a multi-day race, I had a gel without taking on enough water at the same time, and it gave me really bad stomach cramps, so I know the feeling. So definitely try and drink often, um, and take on your energy food, like if you, um, I don't really use gels, because they always, I don't really like the taste of them, and they're bleh. Um, so yeah, whatever you're eating to give you that sugar, um, try taking it on with water. And also, just like Catherine in the one before, um, I would consider energy drinks as well to hydrate more, um, hydrate and give yourself energy at the same time. So um, you could give that a go. Um, and um, there's two um, types of uh, energy sports nutrition um, brands that I really like personally. I know a lot of people like Tailwind, um, so that's a really good recommendation. Um, but I really like Velo Forte and Mountain Fuel. Um, so I've used those a lot. I use them on the Cape Breath Ultra and I, I really like those and they're really good because Velo Forte is not too sweet so it's kind of easier on the palate. And Mountain Fuel do these really nice flapjacks which are just delicious. They just taste like normal flapjacks and but they're full of energy and, and full of good stuff but so not too sweet. Um, so for patrons, I have discounts with Velo Forte and Mountain Fuel. Um, they're my current favorite sports nutrition products. So do check out the files section in the exclusive Facebook group for those. And if you can't find it, then just hit me up on Facebook or Patreon and I will share those codes with you. So let's just have a look um, uh, on the live chat just to see if anybody else has got some, um, some advice for Catherine there and also for Nadia. So um, let's have a look. Mm -mm -mm. Um, blah blah blah. Mm -mm. 
people are still talking about plantar. Um, New phone who just says get real food gels like spring energy or wind force. Yes, so spring energy, I've heard about them before. I think quite a lot of the top athletes use those gels as well. So they use real food rather than synthetic things. Um, and Guy Greatrex says he has a weak stomach and he likes Velo Forte. Um, yeah, Guy has definitely been taking advantage of the Velo Forte discount that I've got <laughs> for patrons. So um, yeah, so he really likes that stuff. I really like Velo Forte because it's it's just not too sweet and it's made from all natural products. So I just I just really like it, but it is super expensive. So that's why I asked them to give me a discount for patrons so that we could all enjoy them for a bit less. Um, ah, here's a good suggestion. Catherine Roberts says malt loaf is super easy on the stomach and easy to eat on the run. That's a nice one as well. So you've got like a bit of slow release at, um, and fast release carbs there. Um, uh, Philip Haddock says race balls are good for energy. Yeah, and there's a recipe on uh, my YouTube channel um, all about how to make your own DIY energy balls. Basically you mix like oats, peanut butter, like dried fruit, nuts, like mix it all up, stick them together with a bit of honey and dates um, and then wrap them into balls, put them in the fridge and take them with you on your run. They're really, really nice. So I should probably put a link to that in the film description below as well. Philip had it also says rice. Yes, yeah, some people like to take rice, like some of the American runners, they'll take burritos as well. I think over there you can get frozen burritos and you can take, uh, you know, if it's a hot day, you can just take them frozen in your backpack and then by the time, like halfway through the race, they're thawed and you can eat them. So um, we don't have those, I don't think in the UK, but you can make your own. Um, and then new phone who dis is, oh, he is becoming a nutrition expert tonight. He says, um, don't use straight sugar drinks, um, but use um, long energy, including maltodextrose and potato starch, like Fuel 5. Ah, oh, Fuel 5 or High 5? maybe fuel five yes so yeah yeah so a lot of those companies will use lots of different types of sugar that uh some which will hit your bloodstream like super quick and then some which will take a little bit longer so they sort of delay the reaction and they 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 ease the curve of that spike of energy so um arlene m has another suggestion she says you can is a starch based drink that's supposed to be very easy on the stomach um, John Arias suggesting porridge, mm, like that. Um, uh, another shout out for Velo Forte bars. Amanda Armstrong said they are delicious. She bought some at the running show. Well, if you would like to buy some more, Amanda, I believe you are a patron, so you get access to special discount code. I think it's twenty five percent off that they've given me. It's incredible. You need it though, because that just makes them a normal price. <laughs> um, so Sonia says she loves the Sport Beans by Jelly Belly, which also give you some electrolytes as well as the sugar rush. That is a really good point. That is. A good point and I should have mentioned that I did think about that earlier and I thought I must mention that electrolytes as well so if you are having stomach problems then do make sure that you are taking on not only water but some electrolytes in that water as well so you can get these little electrolyte tablets that you just pop into the water just pop one in or, or even half um, just um, get your salt levels back up um, John says good to get some normal food in like sandwiches I like hot cross buns they're really nice or you could have like peanut butter and jam sandwiches. They're really nice as well. Like get a bit of moisture going. Um, Seb says he likes cinnamon rolls, uh, cinnamon rolls for long runs. I know Emily Forsberg, top trail runner from Sweden. She loves a good cinnamon bun as well. So I highly recommend that. Um, Nigel Barnett, he's gone old school. He says Nestle sweetened condensed milk comes in handy tubes. Do you know what? I actually met somebody who had one of them on a run once. Um, <laughs> I thought, thought that was great. Um, Great, so coming on to the last question tonight, we have Amanda Armstrong, who is watching right now, brilliant. Um, so she wants to know, this is a great question, I really like this question. So Amanda says, um, would it be possible to have any podcasts or interviews with longer, with sorry, with older runners in the future? I am rapidly approaching 52, which is not old, but lots of the training tips, etc., come from much younger runners. Agreed. Um, just a thought. P.S. Your new podcast is fantastic and perfect for my running. Yes, do check out the new podcast, everybody. Just type in Wild Ginger Running um, on all your usual podcast providers and you will find the Wild Ginger Running Wednesday night shows as podcasts. Woo! Great. So, I think that is a fantastic question, Amanda. Thanks very much for asking that. Um, 
yes, I do sometimes interview the the old folk. So you might like um, Joe Faulkner's interview. Joe is four times Dragon's Back completer. Let's just show you a picture of gnarly old Joe there. So that's Joe. Um, he's done the Dragon's Back race four times, and there is a link to his video um, where I've interviewed him in the film description below. Also, there is Nikki Love, who has run 4,000 kilometers across um, Australia in 63 days. So her interview is on my channel as well, and you'll find a link to that in the film description as well. And I, I do, you have reminded me about this, I have got interviews with Mimi Anderson, um, she's a super duper record breaking ultra runner, and Nikki Love, who I just mentioned. I've got interviews with them at Run Fest Run this time last year. They're both in their 50s and they were talking about running and the menopause and the perimenopause, which is really super great information. So I will edit those and get them out as an exclusive patron release just for you guys next month. Um, I also interviewed um, a few over 50s about ultra running at the National Running Show. So um, there is... An, I've interviewed them about ultra running and speed as well. I did one last year and then I did one this year, which is being edited right now. Um, so have a look at the speedy one um, on my channel. I've put a link in the description below. Okay, uh, so yeah, I hope that an answers your questions there, um, uh, Amanda, because that was a really, really good question. And I, I'll bear it in mind as well um, whenever I do like a compilation or whenever I'm interviewing people um, to get a few more of the older runners there because a, a lot of um, a lot of runners do really well like in their 40s and 50s. The vet 40 and 50 categories are really competitive, especially in fell running. So yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, there's also a book called Fast After 50. Um, I don't have it personally, but I did have it when I was editing Trail Running Magazine, and I know that that was a really useful book as well. Um, oh, a lot of people are 50 um, this year. So Ruth is 50 this year, um, and um, Nigel says he's 57. Good question. Um, great. Yeah, so definitely. Chuck Coffin says, old folks, really? How old? Ha <laughs> ha. Um, Chuck is one of our older patrons. Um, he is awesome. I don't know how old he is. Maybe he will share it on the live chat. Um, but yes, he is older than 50 and uh, he is still running strong. So that's amazing. Oh, Arlene M is approaching 62 this year. Amazing. Cool. Go for it, guys. Um, Chrissy TV says the Lakeland 50 winner was over 40 last year. There you go, you just proved the point. Okay, so we're gonna wrap it up now because um, I have been speaking for a long time and I, but I have a couple of questions I need to ask you which I told you about at the start. So, you know that I've started doing podcasts, right? Should this Q&A go on the podcast version? Should I turn it into a podcast tomorrow? Or should I look into the archive of interesting people that I have interviewed and should I put that one of them up instead? I'm just thinking, is this kind of show useful to people as a podcast? So you don't have to answer it now, but it would be handy if you could put in the comments below when this film stopped being live um, as to whether you would like to um, have this in podcast version or not. Um, I might do it and see how it goes, but it would be interesting to see how what your opinions are. Um, and if I do do it, then I'll go into the archive anyway, and I'll put up probably once a month an extra special podcast for patrons where I um, use um, interviews from the archive. So like I've got like interviews from ages ago with Scott Jurek. You might want that in a podcast. I've got Courtney DeWalter. She came on the live chat after the UTMB. I've got interviews with Emily Forsberg, stuff like that. Um, and there's uh, various different phys like other physios and nutritionists. So um, I'll do a little poll in the Facebook group for patrons um, and we'll decide which of those archive interviews you would like me to put out first as a podcast version. But yeah, should this Q&A be a podcast version or should I just do something from the archive for everybody? Um, okay, and then um, I have a sort of like a little announcement really because I'm just so 
amazingly grateful to all of my patrons, um, I just thought I'd give you a little treat. So I have a more in-depth version of my Kate Bath Ultra film. So it's like five to 10 minutes every day kind of thing. So there's five days and it includes things in there that I couldn't put into the 17 minute edit that I aired on Monday. Um, so it's more interesting, there's like more highs and lows, and, and you find out more about all aspects of the race um, and like kit and blisters and just how things go down. So I'm gonna put that out on Friday in a patron only um, playlist um, with all five films just set to unlisted. So only you guys will get the link and I'll put it on the patron website and I'll put it also in the patron Facebook group as well. So it's five episodes for you to binge watch over the weekend. And I've decided I'm going to do more patron only content going forward. Um, just It's just my way of saying thank you so much for supporting me through this cr kind of crisis time. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to say a just a, such a massive thank you to everybody I'm, I'm so grateful um so that will be coming uh, i'll do something every month that is um just for you guys only um because uh, i've got tons of footage all the time and i'm like oh when can i put this out and then i suddenly thought oh my god i can do it exclusively for patrons this is wonderful so um you'll get like uh top tips from yeah just people that i meet and just things that aren't going on the channel like super good stuff that nobody else can see um, so it's special for you guys. Um, we have some answers already about should I make this into a podcast. So um, Amanda Armstrong says, both please. She likes tonight's as a podcast to re-listen to um, and also archive stuff. No rush, but it's also useful. I know, do you know what? I think podcasts is the way forward. I love podcasts. Like you don't have to sit here watching stuff and yeah, it's great. I love podcasts. Um, I mainly listen to podcasts while I'm doing housework, like boring stuff. You think, oh, I'm still learning. Um, yes. Um, and New Phone Hoodis wants to know when the next movie evening is. Ah, oh, um, I don't know. We should do one though, shouldn't we? Maybe on Friday if we don't have a quiz. Um, Paul Hamilton said, uh, interesting people would interest me most, but this chat is also very interesting, so it would work too. Okay, that is good to know. Um, and uh, Sonia said she'd like the Q&A as a podcast. She thinks it would be great. Um, and Hannah Baisley is excited for the Kate Rath Ultra Extra films, and so is John as well. Oh, good. This is good. Um, oh, Chrissy's got a good idea here. She says, it's nice to hear from ordinary runners too, not just the winners, like um, overcoming the pain wall, etc. Yeah, so I really enjoyed that. Do you remember I did a talk about the spine race with mid-pack, um, two mid-pack runners, Pascal Mathene, who's actually a patron, um, and her husband, Chris. They both did the spine race um, and we interviewed them afterwards together about what it was like because Pascal, unfortunately, um, she had to drop out at about 168 miles, which is amazing, um, and Chris managed to carry on. Um, it was during Storm Bre Brendan, so it was a really tough race. So we chatted to them and, and I think that I would like to do more of interviewing like normal people as well because that's, you know, you're not, no one's an elite athlete, are they? They can give you advice, but I don't know how much, you know, how useful it actually is to listen to elite people's advice versus mid-pack advice. Um, cool, so Arlene M says, thanks for the inspiration, Claire, especially during this crazy time. Brill, I hope you saw the start of the podcast, of the show, Arlene, where I uh, answered your question about the medals. And um, uh, Rich Simpson said, if they're easy to do them, then why not do them like, as like podcasts as well? Um, John said, I think he, he would choose interviews over a QA. and a um, Yeah, but he doesn't always watch this, but he interview, he um, listens to it. Um, Hannah says, is it my interview with John Nyston tomorrow? Looking forward to that too. Yes, I, I am. I'm going to be on John Nyston's Facebook group page, uh, page, I think, um, at midday. So check it out or go and watch me there. And it's going to be really weird because he's going to be interviewing me and usually I'm the one interviewing people. So it's going to be, uh, strange, but hopefully you'll find out some things that you didn't know before. And I'm going to talk about you guys on there as well. Um, I got a nice photo of our last patron meetup that we did together. Um, so I'm, I've sent that to him. So he's going to put that up during the live broadcast. So cool. I'll see you on there as well, Hannah. Um, 
fab. Darren says he's really looking forward to Cape Wrath. Um, and uh, John says um, benefit of podcast is he can listen to the episodes whilst running with the phone locked. Whereas YouTube, you unless you subscribe, you need the phone open. Yes, that's the main reason that I'm doing these podcasts. Cool. Okay. So um, I, I can't believe I've got through all those questions. That is brilliant. Um, and um, and it's just been great to see you all there on the live chat as well. Um, more chats are coming in, but I'm going to wrap it up now. Um, and yeah, I just want to say again, a massive thank you to all the patrons for supporting me at this time because writing work is all gone. Event work is all gone. Um, so yes, patron is basically my life right now. So anything that I can do for you guys, um, it would, yeah, I'm so happy to do it. So I will be doing this as, um, a, a podcast as normal to just see how it goes and test the water, um, based on your reactions here. But I'll also, I'll try to find some time as well to do an archive one and I'll put a little poll in the Facebook group, um, and also in the patron website as well because I know not everybody is on Facebook um, so that we can decide who from the archive we want to dig out and put into podcast form. So um, thanks very much for watching everybody. Um, thank you to all the awesome patrons. Um, stay safe, keep washing our hands and oh my goodness we're going to have to have a mega meet up after this is all over as well. I hope you're all going to come to the running show in 2021. <laughs> Oh my goodness, it's so far away, isn't it? Cool, so, uh, Catherine Dolliver says, super Q&A, thank you. Amanda Armstrong says, excellent Q&A, thank you. John says, thanks very much. Paul says, thanks very much, great job. Uh, Philip says, just keep up the good work, Claire. Aw, thanks you guys, you are amazing. I just couldn't, I couldn't have hoped to have a nicer bunch of people following the channel. I just think you're all awesome. You're so nice to each other and you're so supportive in the Facebook group and you're always, you know, commenting nice things to each other. And I just, I think it's a really nice group. And I just think you're um, brilliant ambassadors for the sport of trail running. I, I just think all of you are wonderful. Um, so thanks, I will just read up a, cu a, a couple more things. Um, Rich Simpson says, bye, we'll catch up on the podcast later. Cool, I will make that tomorrow. And Chris TV says, thanks Claire. So thank you so much for watching everybody. And um, type questions below if you've got any more questions for next time. Um, and patron questions get prioritized. So join me on Patreon, support me on there. It's just there www.patreon.com slash wildgingerrunning um, and you get extra special treatment and extra content and competitions. So, um, good night everybody and have a super Wednesday evening. Bye!